right. Um, next thing I want to show you all is um, how to find the moment of inertia for a um, object that's rotating when it does not have a regular shape and it is not um, uh, made out of some sort of uniformly um, distributed material where the, the mass is evenly spread out through the material. So some of you probably remember that um, when, when I first talked about moment of inertia, which is which is essentially rotational mass, it tells us how difficult it is to change the motion of an object that's spinning. We talked about how it's it is at least potentially um, easy to calculate if you know the mass and shape of an object, provided that it is um, a regular shape and it, the mass is uniformly distributed. So if we have a cylinder and it's rotating about an axis like this, spinning around um, in a circle like this, we can um, use its, its shape. Um, really what we'd be looking at is the distance from the center of rotation to the edges of the cylinder and its mass to find moment of inertia. It's gonna be related in some way to some function of mass and the distance of that mass from the center of rotation. And uh, different shapes have different um, equations that are used to calculate moment of inertia. The simplest thing to think about is a, is a what we call a point mass. So if you imagine a um, an object that's being swung around on a string, then it might be moving, and this is, I'm sort of drawing it in an angle, moving in a circular path like this. Um, if the object has a mass of m, and it's being swung at a distance r from the center of rotation, then its moment of inertia will be m r squared. And that's it. If we have um, a disk that's uniformly distributed, so if it's a, if it's a, um, like a, a cylinder like this, this is a real short cylinder and it's spinning um, about its central axis, then its moment of inertia is going to be one half m r squared. And we can combine things too. So if we have like, if we were to put a point mass on here at some other distance, right? So if we have um, the, the uh, radius of the disk itself and we were to know the radius of the of the um, object on the disk, then it would just be um, the moment of inertia of the disk itself, which is one half mr of the disk squared plus mr of the point mass squared. So these are real easy calculations that we can make if we have regular shapes with a uniformly distributed mass. But if we're looking at our concentric pulley, that's not the case at all. In the front, our concentric pulley looks like this. And from the back, our concentric pulley, or sorry, from the side, our concentric pulley kind of looks like this. There's a bunch of hollow, there's a bunch of like nothing there. There's plastic throughout it, but it's not uniformly distributed. It probably, based on the fact that, um, you know, it's mostly plastic and there's not that many ridges and things like that, it's probably pretty close to approximately one half mr squared, but we're not gonna know for sure. And certainly there are gonna be lots of other objects that we use that um, that are even less predictable than this. Um, I showed you in class an example of a toaster that's kind of spinning on a diagonal. That is not a shape that we have an equation that we can measure something about mass and something about its size and use that to calculate moment of inertia. So if we have an object and we wanna know its moment of inertia, there's another way that we can think about how to find that. And that is to uh, use Newton's second law for um, rotating objects, which says that the sum of torques on an object will equal its moment of inertia times its angular acceleration. If we can measure the sum of torques, which we can you know, often do because torque is equal to an applied force times the 
distance, we call it the lever arm, the distance um, uh, between where that force is being applied to the center of rotation. And we might have more than one torque acting on an object. So we might have um, one torque and another torque. We can add those together. Sum of the torques is going to equal torque one plus torque two. So we could find the sum of the torques by measuring forces, which we in general know how to do, and measuring distances, which of course we know how to do, and then angular acceleration, which we can calculate. And you all know a way that we can calculate um, angular acceleration. We did that with the concentric pulley. We started by finding the tangential acceleration, and, um, and then we can use that to determine the angular acceleration. But that means that we, we have to measure some linear distances. We might be able to do that. That might be super easy to do, and then in which case we can do it. We could also just find the angular acceleration of the disk itself by, um, by looking at how many times it rotates. One rotation is going to be equal to 2 pi radians which means we can find if we if we say that our initial angular position is zero and our final angular position is some number of radians based on the number of rotations it makes and we measure time and we start with an initial angular velocity of zero then we can use this equation our first equation of angular kinematics to find alpha the angular acceleration. So we have a couple different ways that we can find the angular acceleration. Um, it's always going to be easiest to find acceleration if our object is motionless at the start. Um, and of course, we always have to make sure that the um, acceleration is constant. We can't use our kinematic equations if acceleration isn't constant, which means we've got to make sure that the sum of the torques is constant as well. So what I am uh, suggesting and this is um it, in the past has worked fairly well for the um, concentric pulleys that we're using which granted are crummy and um and so because they're crummy there's a there's a whole bunch of ways in which this can become um, rather difficult rather quickly having said that what i would suggest is that you hang one mass off one side of your um, concentric pulley and then hang another mass off of one of the other um, uh, pulleys in a, that it, uh, but in, in a way that would tend to provide the opposite torque. And the reason that you want to do this is because this is going to allow you to, um, to calculate two torques, one in each direction. There's going to be one positive torque and one negative torque and um, it's going to slow down the motion of your concentric pulley. If you just hang one mass over the side and try to use that to figure out what's going on, what you almost certainly are going to find is that you can't get a, a good acceleration without hanging a relatively large mass. And as soon as you hang a relatively large mass, the thing spins so quickly that you, you can't um, do any of the calculations because you can't measure time accurately. So what you want is a nice steady acceleration for a relatively long amount of time. Relatively long, maybe around a second. Something that you can you can time with a stopwatch. Some things to think about here. Um, many of you are going to be inclined to think that um, our forces are going to be equal to the weights of the masses, but that's not true. And that's not true because just like we've seen in the past, these masses are experiencing two forces, an upward force that reflects the tension and the strain, the downward force that's the weight of the object. The acceleration of this mass is going to be equal to the sum of the forces. So the sum of the forces on mass one is going to be equal to tension minus its weight if we say that down is the negative direction. So basically what that means is 
it's going to be trickier than you think to determine the magnitude of the forces acting on your concentric pole. And it's going to be trickier than you think, therefore, to calculate the sum of the torques. What I want you all to do today is um, focus on trying to find some masses that will work. Find masses that, um, with, with a particular concentric pulley, give you a reasonable rate of acceleration. And if you then measure the magnitude of those masses, so you're going to measure the magnitude of each of those masses, and then measure the distance from each of those masses to the center of the pulley. And then you calculate the angular acceleration of the pulley. I would recommend that you do it by using this equation right here. Then we can kind of backfill and we can use this information, um, all of it actually. We're going to need all of this information to, um, to determine the magnitude of the force acting on your concentric pulley at this location the magnitude of the force acting on the pulley pulley at this location is equal to the tension in the string and we can use that to determine the torques the most important thing to recognize is that um, the um, these uh, the the tension in the string is not equal to the weight of each of those objects the tension in the string minus the weight is going to be equal to each mass times its acceleration so the sum of the forces on mass 2 will equal the tension on that side minus the weight on that side, which will be equal to mass two's mass times its acceleration. So it's not it's not a matter of just knowing the mass and saying, well, if I multiply by G, that's going to tell me the force in the string, because it's not. But if you record all this information, you find the mass of the two masses that you've got hanging off either side, you record the distance each mass is located from the center of rotation. You calculate the resulting acceleration. With that information, we can then work together on Friday to look at these two equations and figure out what the um, tension in the string must be. Once we know the tension in the string, we can use that to find the torque acting on the pulley on one side, the torque acting on the pulley on the other side. We can add those two torques together to find the sum of the torques. If we know the sum of the torques and we know the angular acceleration, then the moment of inertia is simply going to be the sum of the torques divided by the angular acceleration. So this is a big task and we'll break it into a couple of days. Um, and for today, these are the things that you need to look at. If you want to try to get further than that, that's fantastic. But these are the big things to do. And this is going to take some time because there's a lot of like futzing around with the police where you're um, you've got you're going to have string tangled up and stuff like that. So it takes a little bit of practice to get it to work right. So that's your job for today. And on Friday, we'll take that and use that to um, kind of put together the very last step so we can actually calculate the moment of inertia of your um, of your concentric pulleys.